So, uh, the second workshop uh, was uh, discussed the problem of constraints on reintroduction. And the speaker for this workshop group is Michel Desilets, who is the executive director of the Orangutan Land Trust. Michel. Thank you. Um, I need to depend on, <coughs> there we go. <coughs> no notes, I just talk about what we've, we've talked about. Um, our group had a, a very vibrant discussion um, and here are some of the things that we came up with. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. In any reintroduction uh, process, and I'll get to the whether reintroduction has a, has a place in conservation, but let's assume it does. Um, one of the things that needs to be addressed and, and perhaps hasn't been addressed as well as it could have been in the past is the habitat suitability and connectivity of the areas into which orangutans are being reintroduced. So in the past, there may have been some failures with reintroduction of rehabilitant orangutans because lack of uh, scientific rigor in determining that these habitats would be suitable in the long term, whether that be for um, the the abundance of resources for the orangutans to survive, or edge effects and threats on the edge, or actual um, eventual conversion of these forests for other uses. Now, right now, there are some unique opportunities in Indonesia, Malaysia, where the orangutans live, to participate in the multi-stakeholder participation in national land use planning. I recently attended um, some conferences talking about connectivity in Kinabantangan and Sabah, um, which involved the, the government as well as NGOs and scientific sector to connect up these fragmented uh, patches of orangutan habitat. And there we start to see reintroduction becoming a viable um, tool in orangutan um, conservation because then we may actually get viable populations, genetically viable populations, and this is important, that connectivity, if it's not already in place, doesn't prevent you from re reintroducing orangutans, but if these fragments are unconnected, you must have a, a proposal towards connectivity eventually in their lifetimes. Um, in Indonesia, there are um, discussions going with the Ministry of Forestry to allocate areas of suitable habitat for orangutans at a cost, to the NGOs um, to, to reintroduce large numbers of rehabilitant orangutans into a large area, um, once again, thereby ensuring a viable population. So uh, in Indonesia, in, for example, the two boss centers, there are close to 1,000 orangutans, another 350 in the, or so in the OFI center in, in Borneo alone, in Kalimantan. Uh, these represent Three, four, three or four viable populations. And if we can put those in one or two contiguous areas, we are actually adding to the conservation um, issue, uh, solution, I should say. Right, uh, number two is, is talking about the, to, to implement more rigorous science-based pre-release assessment of these individuals. Again, that has been one of the failures in past reintroduction, which maybe has given us um, perhaps a, uh, the perception of reintroduction is not as positive as it could be. Um, we are now faced with a, a lot more scientific knowledge and, and participation from the scientific community to assess these individuals uh, to determine their suitability, whether they're clever enough to manage on their own, whether they're healthy enough, if they're not uh, carrying any infectious diseases, um, and these, these kinds of things, and not just put an individual out that has little or no chance of surviving. And following that with rigorous post-release monitoring, which again has been a bit lacking historically. Now, the first um, sub, well, it's not subcutaneous, in, intramuscular tracking devices have been trialed on three orangutans in Sabah. And these tracking devices we intend to use on uh, the first 75 orangutans to be released early next year from Narmenting Project in Kalimantan, uh, rebuilt into orangutans. So 
now science is, is uh, taking a leap forward in addition to um, the traditionally very difficult job of following orangutans on the ground and monitoring them on the ground for long term, and especially in such numbers as 75 or 150 orangutans, um, we have the additional use of this tracking device, which can be read from the air or by land for a couple of kilometers and lasts for about two years. And that will give us a lot more feedback onto how successful indeed we are with reintroductions. Now, it's important, number three, to develop mutual long-term conservation welfare objectives. I'll turn this on and said, there, there are, we're looking at maximizing um, or, or using sustainable financing mechanisms, payments for ecosystem services, forest carbon, REDD, uh, interim funding to secure orangutan habitat. Now, if we can do that, which I believe we can, which is the work of, of my organization and other organizations like mine, then we could address not only the welfare issue of getting orangutans out of cages or out of small centers where they're overcrowded, um, but again, contribute to the conservation goals. And this would also mean that we maybe do not have to make a huge choice between the do donor contribution, where we're going to spend it, excuse me, because private sector and the voluntary market may pick up the cost associated with reintroduction post-release monitoring, and the management of these new populations. Then the costs that, uh, the donor costs that are donated for more welfare-based issues, such as picking up orangutans at risk and looking after them, uh, does not have to be, you don't have to make an either-or decision on that. And then finally, it's important that all reintroduction plans must be pur purposeful. They must be looking towards this long-term conservation goal of creating viable populations. Um, they must be flexible in their objectives. They must be subject to adaptive management, learning from past and future uh, experiences and changing the program as we go along. Um, and very important that there's transparent reporting of all this. Transparent reporting not only of how money is spent, but how successful or indeed unsuccessful any aspect of this process has been. I could have the next slide. Thank you. So we came to um, a couple of conclusions. Basically, our, our topic was constraints on reintroduction. And we found that there are opportunities to overcome the recognized constraints that are associated with the reintroduction. And that reintroduction not only addresses welfare issues, as we know, but it does offer exciting new prospects for population reestablishment in support of orangutan conservation. So once again, it's, it's using these individuals that we as humans have displaced through conversion of their habitat for uh, timber or oil palm or other crops, um, picking up those pieces, but having an end objective in sight, getting them back out into the wild, not just for their own sake and because it's right to do so for their sake, but also to uh, introduce new and viable populations in sustainable, long-term, secure locations. And I think that's about it. Is that Thank short you. enough? <laughs> Thank you. Very timely indeed.